preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Well, good morning. And, <laughs> and here we are at the final scene. <coughs> but if that sounds too dreary, cheer up. We have a sequel. <laughs> That's not in the nature of an advertisement. On behalf of the committee, I want to thank you for your enthusiasm, for your letters to the Y expressing it, and for your helpful response to our questionnaire. Incidentally, your enthusiasm wasn't one way because every speaker to date has commented on the very special quality of this audience. In fact, Bill Moyers wrote us a letter in which he said just that, that uh, he had really come across so responsive and stimulating an audience. Well, we hope you'll continue to be this audience. And if you can't come to our seminars, do join us again next fall as members of the 100 Club. Today we have a special feature. Someone said of our speaker that she is mad about movies, not at them. But she brings to her role as critic not only a passion for film, but a great flair for words and expertise as a writer, which goes back a long way. She started as a reporter on the Herald Tribune, became an editor for the arts, a drama critic, and a film critic on that paper. She is at present a professor of journalism at Columbia and a trustee of the University of Pennsylvania. Since 1963, she's been a film and drama commentator on the Today Show and is film critic for TV Guide and New York Magazine. She published a book in 1968 called The Private Eye, The Cowboy, and The Very Naked Girl, Movies from Cleo to Clyde. As for her awards, I can't begin to list them for you. Walter Kerr made the point here that movies may well be replacing the theater in the public's favor. Judith Christ is here today to tell us why. With great pleasure, I present Ms. Christ. <clears throat> it's been one of my uh, contentions that everything I know about life, I know from the movies and that I have traveled the world over eight million times, courtesy of movies. Uh, I thought I'd been to the North Pole, courtesy of the movies, uh, but today I felt that life had it over the movies. And I think anyone who would venture out in this cold is immediately that enthusiastic audience that Mrs. Siegel was referring to. Uh, the quote from Walter Kerr really gives me a light motif uh, for our discussion because I really don't think of this in terms so much of a lecture as a conversation. Uh, the one truly great film critic that we have had in this very young uh, medium because after all film, well they keep trying to celebrate its centennial and then there's always somebody who insists that he flickered something uh, five years earlier or that somewhere there is a record of something <coughs> moving in light and therefore that makes it film. But actually this is a very young medium. But I think one of the first and undoubtedly the greatest of the film critics, James Agee, asked, as we always are, to define film criticism, said that it was a conversation between or among moviegoers. And so I hope that ours will be a conversation. I had started out initially and professionally in theater. And today, most film critics find themselves looking at theater critics in a sort of patronizing way and saying, ah, yes, uh, well, you know where the action is today. Uh, and the more we go to theater, the more often we are convinced uh, that the action is on that great big silver or multicolored screen in the dark uh, and that the fabulous invalid is just not all that fabulous anymore. On the other hand, and before I go into the glories of film, 
I really think we have to recognize the one thing that the theater has, that movies, for all their pretensions, and they have it particularly now, uh, toward cinema verite, toward capturing the true, the living, the moment for the permanent record, theater has an aliveness. It has a flesh and blood creativity to it that nothing on film can possibly duplicate. Because we talk about film as very many things. We talk about it as an art form. That's my sort of favorite bet noir these days uh, because I feel that it very rarely has art and very rarely has nowadays particularly even any form. But it is a construction. It is a contrivance. It is a matter of cutting and pasting and gluing together. Where in the theater, when someone says or someone does, it is something that will never come again. And so when you, as I have to, leaven your life uh, that you spend in the dark with the overpowering artifice of film in front of you, uh, I think every so often you have to go back and see people talk and people dance and people sing uh, and people think and self-propel themselves on a stage as certainly they never do in film. Uh, and when someone gets up and belts out a song or even messes up a song, at very least, you know that is here and now, and the person who is singing is singing at that particular moment. And 89 technicians have not sat around and cut the film so that she will look beautiful and have looped the sound and perhaps even gotten someone else to hit the high notes. Uh, your moments of disillusion are always there. Uh, if you see Elizabeth Taylor naked, you don't see Elizabeth Taylor naked. It is a little Italian starlet they've brought in for the moment uh, to walk up the stairs in reflections in a golden eye. Uh, if you're seeing Rosemary's baby and there's a great fantasy in which Mia Farrow is lying there naked being taken by the devil, uh, it's not Mia Farrow's bosom. It's somebody else's bosom. So that if you see any of these good things on the stage, at very least, you are seeing it, which I think is one of my objections. Of course, one of the very current debates that one would have about film would be on the matter of nudity. And I'm a great advocate of nudity on film uh, over the stage. I'm not per se an advocate of it anywhere, but where you choose to go around naked or to see it. Uh, and that is simply that on film, nudity is so much nicer because the bodies can be properly oiled and the cameras can be properly adjusted and it becomes a very beautiful, aesthetic, never, never land of flesh. Whereas and those of us who patronize the off-Broadway theater know it even better than those who go to the on-Broadway theater, uh, the human body on the stage is not necessarily the most exquisite thing that we uh, want to see. Uh, those of us who happen to be born without mirrors in our home and are <laughs> perishing for the sight of the naked body. Uh, and so the comparisons between theater and film, while they occupy a great deal of our time and while indeed the two media serve each other, uh, to me have reached the point of being odious. It's sort of an endless debate and each medium has its moments. But something has been happening in film and I suppose as a well, to put it politely, aging debutante, I sort of resent uh, the notion that suddenly this is a movie world. Well, it was very much a movie world 30 years ago and 40 years ago when I was going to the Saturday matinees and movies were the most exciting thing around. And as many of us, <clears throat> then even more of us, were going out and losing our souls in the dark and living the vicarious lives. I think that what has happened to film in the past 10 years, because certainly the 60s have been a most important time 
in our society, in every aspect of our society, uh, as well as in film. What has been happening in movies is very much a reflection of what has been happening to us. Another very common point of debate uh, that goes on perpetually is, uh, do movies influence or do movies reflect? Uh, and I have developed rather pat answers to this. Yes, they influence. We all went around wearing ankle straps and shoulders out to here uh, because Joan Crawford did. Uh, and the underwear industry was affected when Clark Gable took off his shirt. Uh, and interior decoration uh, is affected. Uh, Doris Day made that great split-level ranch uh, with the dreamy kitchen, uh, the dream of the everyday housewife. Uh, yes, they influence all right. But movies are made by people. And people are products of our society. And a movie takes two years, portal to portal, minimally, from the inception of a film until the day that you see it in your movie house. And the world, certainly in the past 10 years, moves very, very quickly. And morals and mores change. And film production is a very slow activity. Well, it seems to me that what has been happening in the past 10 years is that the movies have far more rapidly than in the past caught up with where society is. It's really stunning to us to think that it was only 10 years ago that for the first time, the American movie audience at large, now I don't mean the people who looked at stag movies, and I don't mean the people who went to little art houses where occasionally a film struggled or was picked up by a cult and so on, but where the mass audience had the dubious enlightenment of seeing in a film, in a theatrical film, two people of opposite sexes in the same bed, not wearing nightgowns and pajamas up to here, but actually intertwined and making love, as we would say in the vernacular. And this was in Hiroshima, Mon Amour. And this burst upon the screen. I myself remember sort of blinking my eyes as the movie began and saying, what's this? Uh, I find myself doing this in a just about every other movie I see nowadays because you're never quite sure what part of the anatomy you're looking at. Uh, and if you're exploring a wart, whether it's on somebody's toe or his nose or some less mentionable part of the anatomy. However, with Hiroshima, there came the enormous impact. And we did a number of things that we're prone to do. We immediately have to explain away uh, impacts. And we thought, well, of course, this is because uh, the American film uh, is so Neanderthal and so puritanical. Uh, and really, you know, only the Continentals uh, are really sophisticated. Ah, these foreign films. Uh, and we began to have a very passionate uh, affair uh, with the subtitle. And uh, in the early 60s, I think most of us were under the illusion uh, that if a film was small and square, and in black and white, uh, and kind of murky, so that it looked as if it had all been made in a hall closet. Uh, and the people were very grubby. Their teeth hadn't been capped, uh, and the man always needed shaves, uh, and uh, everything looked a little bit dirty, and we couldn't recognize anybody. There were great unknowns that this was life and this was real, uh, and we couldn't understand it, and the grammar in the subtitles was absolutely abysmal, uh, and that therefore made the whole thing art. So we began a very passionate affair uh, with the foreign film. Uh, actually, American movies have progressed, as every one of our industries have, only through economic necessity. And the only thing really that has awakened American movie makers to the here and the now and the today is a purely economic, competitive situation. At the Paris 
well, you may recall about three years ago at Expo, uh, all the national magazines and everyone was in a twit. Oh, the things they were showing you that they could do with movies at Expo, it was absolutely thrilling. You just had to go. And movie maker after movie maker had to, on the expense account, of course, take a trip up to Canada to see the fantastic things they were doing. Well, strangely enough, there was not a thing that they were doing at Expo in 1967 that they had not exhibited and done at the Paris Exposition in 1900. Because once you have invented a camera and once you have invented film, there are a certain number of things you can do. Sort of the reason that we find ice shows so boring. I mean, there's a point at which you reach all that the human body can do when it's attached to a pair of skates. <laughs> and this is in part true with film. They had circular exposures, 360 degree projection, you know, so you stood in the middle of the room and it was all around you. Uh, they had multiple images on a screen. Uh, they had just about every trick you could think of along with the three-dimensional, since the stereopticon, anybody can make things three-dimensional, and they had talkies. Now, the reason we didn't have talkies was that silent movies are much cheaper and easier to make. But when radio came in and people began sitting home and listening to radios and letting their imaginations do a little bit of work, and not going to the silent movies, the manufacturers naturally had to add sound. And so we had talkies through World War II and up into the 50s. And A, there came these foreign films that were real. They didn't have Gary Cooper uh, yupping around the screen. Uh, they didn't have the twin beds and the very sanitary uh, ranch houses. If you've seen any of those movies of the 30s, uh, the Stark Depression movies, and you look at the guys in the bread line, it's really to laugh. You've never seen cleaner bunches of starving people uh, than you would see uh, in the great Warner Brothers sociology movies of the 30s. And we not only began getting the foreign film, but pretty soon there was that terrible little box in the house where you could see films for free. And it was at this point that there came the other expansion from Hollywood, and that was the large screen. And we went from 35 millimeter, which was the traditional square screen, up to 70 millimeter, uh, you know, and this is where you can dive into anybody's mouth and never come up. Uh, or you can count all the caps on every tooth. And we got all sorts of odd shapes. Uh, initially, we all felt we were kind of looking through a Venetian blind slat, uh, and that was called Panavision. Uh, and we had Cinemascope, and you got Cinerama. And you got every sort of process. Well, people weren't quite about to pay for all of that, and that was horribly expensive. And uh, the foreign market was expanding, and you know those Europeans, uh, those sophisticated continentals, and then along were coming the Swedes and the Danes with you know what. And so finally, Hollywood began to discover sex. And in Hollywood's way, it has always been about 150 light meters behind the public, because suddenly, on the Hollywood screen, and gee, just very recently in Radio City Music Hall, you could commit adultery and not drop dead. And if you stop to consider the portion of the American population who has committed adultery and not dropped dead, uh, you can get a notion of how with it uh, the movie industry basically had been. Uh, because sin was perpetually punished, and uh, tragically in our society it is not, uh, and the good guys wore the white hats and you could recognize them 
And the bad guys not only wore the black hat so that you could recognize them, but they were all justly damned by the end of the time. And so Hollywood basically was attempting to meet its competition, but not very well succeeding, because at the same time there had been a total economic change and dissolution in the movie industry as an industry. The large studio systems, having gone through the depression of the initial impact of television, were disintegrating. Uh, actors decided that they were not slaves uh, and uh, not atypical actors thinking, uh, that people were paying to see them and therefore they wanted to run the show and you began having split-offs first by actors, then by producers who thought, why should I pay the studio all this rent? Uh, I can go and stand on the uh, Rue de la Paix with a camera uh, and take my background scenes there without paying 90 technicians to build me a very expensive set. And all of these breakaways with the expansion of the world market uh, broke down Hollywood, so that when we say Hollywood now, we really don't mean that place anymore with some of the studios around it and so forth. And I think it's become a totally generic <coughs> term, a kind of the American movie industry. And when one says, oh, typical Hollywood thinking, uh, it really is not located exclusively in California. It is where the big movie production thought is going on, and that happens to be all over the world. You think of an American movie, where well, usually it has stars of 15 nationalities. Uh, it has been filmed in 48 locations and three foreign studios, and the only thing about it basically, uh, the only American thing about it, is the money. Uh, this we often talk about one of I consider one of the better pictures of recent years, and that was the line in winter. Uh, well, it was done entirely uh, in Britain with a British cast, but it was financed by American money, and therefore we lay claim this was an American film. And this goes on all the time. With the disintegration of the studios, there suddenly came the rise of the independent movie maker. And his independence is debatable, but at least he is not attached to a studio. Now, in Europe, essentially, what had been happening with films since World War II was that it was a relatively new industry. The major pre-war, going back through the history of film, the major original creative work had come out of Germany but the German studios were dissolved. And we had the rise of the Italian filmmakers. Uh, the French industry continued. Uh, in Eastern European countries, uh, there was a rise of film creativity and production, more essential perhaps uh, than the creativity, which wasn't given too full reign in the East, uh, particularly in the years right after the war. And we got the rise of the director, the person who creatively made the film. In the United States, you had the studio, which owned the deal. Then came the producer, and he was the man who put the whole thing together. And then came the man who directed the film. And under him came the actors. And under them, way at the bottom, as most writers will tell you, came the writer, who had very little status in film. Uh, he wrote his script, and he got paid, and that was the end of that. And anything that happened to it, well, eventually he could go fight the union and complain. But the writer has always been regarded uh, as just about nothing in the scheme of American film production. In Europe, most directors, and again, this is a lack of money that leads to the greatest creativity, 
uh, to the greatest innovation. The most exciting things you will find in movies, you will find uh, being done by the newcomer, uh, the man without too much money. Uh, part of the reason we never got anywhere really creatively and excitingly in movies is that we've been too rich. Uh, if uh, a director wants to do something, oh yeah, there's a technician there because the studio technicians, their average age I think is approximately 80. Now literally, uh, at Columbia Studios, their average age is 67. Uh, there will always be a cameraman who says, oh yes, I remember a movie we made back in 27. Uh, and the way we did that was we built a platform and we swung the camera around on a crane and that only cost $75,000 uh, and that'll only take, uh, you know, two or three days to do. Uh, and fine, go ahead and do it. That is the American way. But in the European way, not only is there not this stultifying backlog of how we have always done things, but also there was no money, and therefore people found out ways to do things. To get a great big camera up on a dolly, to move it on tracks, to photograph a man running down a, a street, is a very expensive proposition in an American film. But you've got a young movie maker in Europe who thought, well, gee, why don't I just pick up the camera and run? And we got the handheld camera, which came upon us in absolute astonishment. And this was in Jean-Luc Godard's Breathless. I mean, why was this happening? Why were you looking here and looking? Good God, it was a handheld camera. And American directors began to, oh yes, I remember once back in 1930, uh, somebody, yes, we held a camera. Uh, but it's much nicer to have a crew of 22 men building all sorts of tracks and trucks and dollies for your camera, so why bother? And out of the so-called poverty theory of creativity came the totally creative man in Europe. And this was a director, a man with an overall concept for a film, who might get himself a writer, but he wrote with the writer. You will find that most European directors are also co-authors. If not total authors, they do participate in the script. And they maintain the right over their film from beginning to end. As we all know, it is much easier to maintain your right over something that costs $100,000 than it does to maintain your right over something that costs $20 million, as American movies are now beginning to cost, just as a matter of course. And we have gotten bigger and bigger and bigger because that's your answer. Oh, well, you know, people don't want to see these little things, these little amateur things with all unknowns. And we have clung endlessly to the big theory of lushness uh, in every way. Now, these things I say about movies, they apply, I think, to just about every other material aspect of our cultures. Uh, what is the American way, look at our automobiles, uh, as well as our movies. Uh, there is a bigness, uh, there is a plushness uh, versus uh, the way it is done elsewhere in the world. Well, on a more creative level, as one is able to operate, say, away from a studio or in Europe, we again have been influenced and a great many young movie makers have been able to get into the scene. Uh, the Hollywood setup no longer exists. There isn't that much structure. Uh, the price of movie making has changed. And what we have had in the 60s essentially has been an opening up. Uh, of the discovery that people do respond 
to certain things, and therefore you can gamble on them. Uh, we have had uh, a total revolution in camera making. Uh, this is purely an industrial achievement. Uh, and camera and film uh, is a lot more available. Uh, think of all the people you know who own 8 millimeter movie cameras, uh, home movies, uh, versus the people who 20 and 30 years ago owned even little home cameras. Uh, in the Hollywood movie, uh, it was always uh, only Shirley Temple, it seemed to me, only Shirley Temple's rich grandfather, who was sort of a baron or something, uh, could ever take little movies of little Shirley Temple. I mean, that was simply for the idle rich. Uh, and uh, this has become uh, almost an everyday thing. I don't know how it is in your school. In my school, uh, the eighth graders can go around manufacturing movies to their heart's content, uh, all of which uh, I find a rather dubious achievement. But what has happened is that much in the way that in my generation we were going to write the great American novels, so I find that in this college generation uh, they're going to make the great American movies. And much as it was in my generation, uh, very few of us had anything to write great American novels about. Uh, I suspect that that is one of the flaws uh, in this great outburst of movie making. But when you consider that from dawn until dark, we are essentially surrounded by movies. We are surrounded by visuals that move. And uh, whole generations, I think by now, uh, two generations have been practically weaned on motion picture because we can talk as we will about television 98 percent of it is motion picture whether it's on tape or whether it's on film this is a matter really of process but you are saturated in your own home by movies and it would be freakish if we did not then produce a motion picture oriented generation. So the youth explosion as far as film is concerned seems to me an outgrowth purely of the technological advances within our own society. Now what essentially has been happening in the content of film in this country is absolutely flabbergasting to me, uh, simply because I see just about every theatrical film that is shown here. And as I become aware of what I am accepting and dismissing today, uh, that probably would have stood my hair on end uh, a mere five years ago, uh, it, I, I can't think of, perhaps this happens in every period of history, I can't think of any society that has made so quick a transition in the things it accepts. Uh, just when I was leaving the house today, I heard uh, some further uh, news reporting on the uh, birth control hearings uh, in Congress and discussion of the pills. And, uh, and I, there is a very good example. Uh, I cannot think of news reporting uh, that would have gone into uh, birth control and its various processes, uh, certainly not on an early morning news program. Uh, you just didn't talk about those things in general. Uh, if you did, it was much better to talk about it uh, at midnight or, or after, uh, much in the way that television, as you know, gives those public service commercials uh, after midnight. And I'm always very fond at 3 in the morning uh, while I'm watching my 98th rerun of the day uh, I'm also an insomniac, uh, to be urged by, during the course of this movie uh, to join Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, to adopt a child, uh, not to be a high school dropout, uh, to join the Girl Scouts. Uh, they have all of these piled up uh, very carefully at the end of the day. 
Uh, but we talk about things. I find myself talking with relative strangers uh, about uh, subjects I would not have dared raise with my own mother. Uh, and this has happened all within five years. Uh, when I did my book, which was essentially a collection of things, uh, I, it covered, it was subtitled, Movies from Cleo to Clyde which was, to me, an extremely interesting period in film. And it began with that Cleopatra of Elizabeth Taylor in 1963, and it ended with Bonnie and Clyde in 1968. Because to me, here was the last of the moguls, the last of these horrendous spectaculars, the last movie on which anyone would spend $40 million. Of course, I didn't know about Catch-22 at the time. I think that's now worked its way up to $24 million. Uh, but uh, the last of the grandiose, dumb, dumb spectacles, uh, which was providing a circus for the morons, uh, which involved the big buildup, which involved those millions of extras, most of them dead. Uh, which uh, just was, you know, full of cloth of gold and everything else, uh, versus the very small movie made with relative unknowns. Uh, at the time it was made, uh, Warren Beatty might as well have been an unknown, and Faye Dunaway was, uh, and a movie that said something very specific and very relevant and said it in very contemporary terms uh, that had its message encased in a very palatable drama that was pure cinema. Uh, it was told in a way that you could not have told it in a book or in a play uh, or in a ballet. Uh, it had something to say that it said purely visually. Uh, there has been, for example, a great deal of talk recently about blood ballets, God help us, uh, which is the intellectual way, I suppose, of making sheer voyeurism of nauseating sadism acceptable. You talk about blood ballets. Uh, I think in Bonnie and Clyde, uh, indelible in my memory is the final slaughter of these two people. Uh, call it a blood ballet, it's in slow motion. Uh, and it is a demonstration that when you are shot, you don't say, whoops, and collapse, and that's the end of the whole thing. That dying is a very long process, and that killing someone is not easy. And it goes on and on, and bodies shudder, and bodies shake, and it is bloody. And this to me was a bloodbath or blood ballet, if you will, uh, to a purpose, to a point, because this very modern movie of 1968 that shocked half the population uh, basically was a very old-fashioned morality tale. And it said that those who live by the sword shall die by the sword. If you're going to substitute sawed-off shotgun, that's your option. Uh, and it said, those who put themselves beyond the pale and live against society cannot get back in. And those who sin will be punished. It was as simple as that. And so when people say, what is happening with movies? Nothing very much. The people who have something to say in movies and who are saying it in movie terms, uh, who are talented and creative people are making very exciting and very thrilling movies. And people who are making dirty movies and dumb movies and uh, idiot movies uh, are making dirty and dumb and idiot movies. And it is exactly uh, in the same as our literary trend. What are the best sellers? Oh, go ahead, read Jacqueline Suzanne, if you will, or Harold Robbins. Uh, what are the best sellers in, in movies? 
they are not that far apart. This, of course, goes without saying, and I don't think we have to say, that to me, movies of all the media have the greatest impact. Because movies are bigger than you are. You sit and watch television and you dominate it. You can turn it off, you can walk away. Uh, it's there and you are here. And we know that it is only the very great accomplishments of television that will ever drag us right into that little box. But you go into a movie house and you sit in the dark. And I discovered this after reviewing plays, where you know, I come out with endless sheaves of notes. Uh, I had to get a pen with a flashlight for the movies. The movies are very, very dark. And you sit there by yourself. It is a very solitary experience. And you are dominated by this enormous thing that is happening on screen. And this is a very powerful influence. It is a limited influence. You go from your everyday life into this and then you come back out. Whereas many people feel television is so much there all the time uh, that this is a far greater influence. I think the people who have television with them all the time are totally ignoring it or else you couldn't stand it, really. Not unless they just ran good movies all the time. Uh, but uh, they become inured to it. But with movies, because you have paid, because you have made the ritual of leaving your home and going, you give yourself to it. In the theater, there are performances, as we know, and plays that just grab us up. But for the most part, you're sitting there, you can see everybody all around you, you're all in the glow of the footlights, and the people up there are the same size as you are. And there is a very great difference in the ultimate effect on you. And when we hear things coming off that screen, their impact is absolutely flabbergasting. And when I think that I was flabbergasted, but a mere what, three years ago, to hear <laughs> Elizabeth Taylor, was it? it? Must have been four years ago. Say, son of a bitch. And someone else said, let's hump the hostess. And I'd heard this in the theater, but this was Albee and this was the theater, and we paid three times as much. Uh, and well, we were used to really facing the realities of life in the theater. When you heard these things come off in stereophonic sound, the effect was very, very different. And I was jolted. And I thought, gee, I don't really like that. Uh, you're jolted in the same way that you pass a fence somewhere and you see an obscene word on it. Uh, and this is uh, what happens to you now in about 90% of the films to which you subject yourself. Because the main problem is, because we grew up in that great tradition of movies being entertainment, and well, let's go somewhere, oh, we'll go to the movies. Uh, and uh, you were kind of taken out of yourself uh, and uh, put in Never Never Land. Uh, we still have that feeling. And most people today are jolted when they go to the movies uh, because they are seeing things that have a very great impact on them. I was driving along and somebody uh, backed up, I thought incorrectly, and I said several things. I voiced invectives. And my husband was horrified. And when I stopped and thought of my vocabulary, I realized that these are all words, mind you, that I had known, that I would never have dared utter aloud if I did not sit in the movies day after day and hear perfectly respectable movie stars saying them all the time. And in a moment of stress, out came this beautiful alliteration uh, of referring to a farmer. And uh, the car was from Alabama, of course. 
Uh, and there I was. And I thought, wow. Now, what happens to all, said I, my New York snobbishness. No wonder all those nice ladies in Iowa uh, who write to the Today Show are just horrified by what they're hearing in the movies. And this is taking a generation. And my very favorite story on impact uh, involves my son, who was then about nine years old, nine or ten. And it was before the rating system. And I was much freer to send him to the movies I thought he would enjoy. And he had gone to see The Professionals, the movie about four men, you know, soldiers of fortune hired to rescue a kidnapped girl from a bandit's lair in Mexico. And one day I got a phone call via the mayor's office, no less. I was then head of the New York Film Critics from a woman in Brooklyn and said, something simply has to be done. And the mayor's office obviously had had her for a while. And some non-friend of mine had switched her to my phone. Uh, and she uh, said that something had to be done about filthy movies. Her daughter had gone to see a movie and had come home and was absolutely prostrated. And I said, well, what was the movie? She said, The Professionals. I said, what was with The Professionals? Well, that's a great movie. I've been sending people to it in droves. She said, do you know that there is a naked lady in The Professionals? I said, there is. I said, gee, you're absolutely right. And this is that when the bandit, the soldiers of fortune finally come to this marvelous place and they're all staked out to rescue the girl, they look through the uh, sort of opening and there is the girl sitting on a bed and she takes off whatever drape she's had on her and you see the back of her and the bandit comes in and much to the horror of the guys who've come to rescue her, she throws herself at the bandit and they embrace. And that's the end of that, you see. But you saw the naked lady from the back sitting on a bed. This was, I hasten to add, about four years ago. And she went on and on about this kind of filth has to be suppressed, this will not do. And I was getting more and more bored with her and I said, look, madam, I think if you have a 13-year-old girl uh, who takes to her bed after seeing a naked lady, you should worry about her and not about movies. And we very impolitely ended the conversation. And then I turned to my son. And I thought, well, well, I have been corrupting him. And I said, uh, Steve, do you remember a naked lady? We call them ladies in our house. Uh, a naked lady in the professionals. And he said, what naked lady? I said, well, you remember when the professionals climb up to the bandit's place and they're going to save the girl and they look through the window? And he said, I don't know a naked lady. He said, that's when Woody Strode had his longbow ready. <laughs> and this is absolutely all that he saw. And movies are so entirely in the eye of the beholder. Uh, I have seen people come out of the same movie house, people of exactly the same background, and one of them will say, what a marvelous, moving experience, and the other says, boy, what a piece of trash. And that, I think, is great, because God help us all if we all had the same taste in anything, let alone movies. But I think the very essential thing that has happened to movies by now is that there is something for everyone. There is more variety than we have ever experienced before. So that no matter what your taste is, you can satisfy it, provided that you know what you are going into. Uh, I think there are a great many issues, and I'd rather we talked about them than that I talked at you about them. But for example, there is the question of censorship. And I believe in none. I believe in self-censorship. Uh, I believe in censorship on the part of the movie maker and on the part of the movie goer. I don't think it's anybody else's business. I myself am opposed to this rating schedule. I'm not about to have theater owners decide what my child can or cannot see uh, before the age of 17. Uh, 
there are a great many things involved in it. And yet, I must say that when I see certain films, I do have that gut reaction of this shouldn't be shown. Uh, this is not right. Uh, I recently attacked my beloved Lowe's theaters for showing a movie that, to my way of thinking, should be playing at the Rialto. It should not be at Lowe's State. Gee, that's where I saw The Wizard of Oz. I mean, I don't want a dirty Swedish movie there. And then I stop and say, well, why am I calling it a dirty Swedish movie? Well, because I thought it was dumb and exploitative and dreary and ugly and boring and on and on. Uh, well, you know, I've liked something like Vixen and all the loving couples, and I'm sure other people thought those were dirty American movies that were dumb and boring and ugly and so forth. And maybe it's that I like real sexy, big busted brunettes. That's what they were in Vixen. Uh, and uh, someone else likes nice, lanky, blonde Swedish girls. Uh, this is I wonder where definitions begin. Uh, in New Jersey, I was testifying at uh, a commission they have on obscenity. And just that day, the appellate court there had okayed Curious Yellow. And it was a disaster to try to convince a very nice middle-aged woman uh, that I didn't have to like Curious Yellow. I think it's an awful movie. I think it's badly made. I think it's cheap sociology. Uh, I think it's worse philosophy and even worse movie making. Uh, but that there are people who think it has value. Uh, there are people who want to see it. And when anyone says, why are they flooding us with all this pornography? Uh, I keep insisting that if you have to pay 250 to get in, nobody's flooding you. You don't have to go. Uh, we aren't chain-ganging the country and forcing them into movie houses. Uh, but we have reached the point where we are accepting the fact uh, that people have bodies, that people have vocabularies, uh, that we are not, all of us, Mary Poppins at home or abroad. And I think this has been very healthy for any number of people. Uh, it keeps us from being lonely. Uh, things, people see things done on the screen or said on the screen that they have done and said uh, and perhaps worried about uh, and felt solitary about. Uh, and this is what the finer movies do. This, of course, is what a good book will do or a good play. Uh, it will tell you something about you. Uh, and it seems to me that we are getting closer and closer uh, to that point uh, of being able to recognize the people on the screen, and not because they're movie stars, uh, but more and more because they are people. Uh, as the old joke goes, just like you and me. Uh, but in a way, we have gotten over the adolescent feeling of a hero of a heroine. Uh, it is of learning something about flesh and blood. And movies are returning to that. Uh, there is still a great place for the Walt Disney movie. And people love Walt Disney movies. We all love Cinderella. Uh, I detest the sound of music. Well, 180 million people adore it. Why? It's very simple. They love Cinderella, and it's Cinderella. Instead of fairy godmothers, you got fairy mother superiors. But it's the same story. And we will always love it. We would be less than human if we did not. And above all, you could take your five-year-old and your great-grandmother and your cousin from Indiana and your uncle from Paris, France, and you could all sit there and enjoy Cinderella together. And that is very good. Uh, and why get mad uh, at things that are great, big, schmaltzy reproductions of novels? I think there's a great deal of room for that. 
I like what I call a movie movie. I mean, I want Lana Turner to suffer. I want Joan Crawford to be wicked and get her face fixed and turn good. Uh, that kind of thing. I think we all have uh, our fairy tales. Uh, and that this was the year of Easy Rider is very satisfying to me. Uh, I did not like the film. I don't think it's a good movie. I think there's one brilliant performance in it. But it's a Gestalt movie. Not a Gestalt, pardon me, a Rorschach movie. Uh, you look at it, and you will see just what you want to see in that movie. And I have had people argue to the blood over it. Uh, but each one is perfectly justified. And basically, my theme in discussing film uh, is that every man should be his own critic. Uh, the only function of the critic is uh, for me to say, well, I think this. Uh, at which point, you're supposed to say, ooh, so brilliant, absolutely. I agree. And that's why we're all brilliant on points of agreement. Uh, but essentially, I think the hope of the critic is that somebody says, no. Uh, I feel this and this and this. Uh, and then we have points of discussion, uh, because it is in disagreement uh, that we can get anywhere, that, that there will be any kind uh, of intellectual or cultural process. It seems to me I've talked a very long time, said very little, but I'd be delighted to answer anything you have to say. Well, you know, there have been a number of books about the Hollywood Ten uh, and the work they did in film uh, and so forth. Uh, Polanski was one of them. Uh, they were called the Unfriendly Ten or the uh, Hollywood Ten. They had varying uh, names. Uh, and I don't think, because of the time, you know, just before the McCarthy uh, witch hunts, uh, there was a great deal of so-called liberal material in films. Uh, we were very pro-Russian at the time. Uh, we were very pro-Union. Uh, we were very, there is a real age of liberalism, and I don't think anybody could trace any propaganda to these people. They were blacklisted, not for inserting pro-communist propaganda in films. Uh, they were blacklisted because they wouldn't testify at a witch hunt, uh, most of them, uh, because they were involved with the Communist Party. And so they were blacklisted for giving the industry a bad name and because the studio heads who were in control at the time were Neanderthals. Uh, but uh, what kind of propaganda is there uh, in film, I wonder? Political propaganda, uh, again, uh, you have to be sure that you are reaching people. Yes, if you look at the World War II movies, uh, there was, you know, great win the war propaganda, and Germans were beasts, and, and ja the Japanese were less than beasts, uh, and uh, those were presumably propaganda films. Uh, but they were, in a way, rather good movies. stimulated, very excited. 
by the end of the movie, I fell asleep. I was absolutely no, that's too bad. out of my yeah. mind. I thought they are just trying one technique after another to shock. Well, we'll try a little bit of this, and we'll try a little bit of that, and all the impetus that I felt the movie started out with, by the end of the movie, had left me in the very final scene. I fell asleep, and I had to ask my husband, did it get any better, or did it just continue, in my opinion, downhill? And I would be interested in that. And, and they ran out of money. They did run out of money, and they couldn't reshoot the last scene, which could have been marvelous. Um, Putney Swope. Well, I have a very special feeling uh, about that film. I happen to, I'm, my list of the ten best, because there weren't ten extraordinary movies last year at all. Uh, but uh, I, so I picked them by genre, and I thought that Putney Swope was the best of the young, aspiring American filmmaker movies to have come along, the purely independent movie, you know, where he just went around getting money from various people and shooting, shooting, shooting to get his movie done. Uh, I have followed the career of Robert Downey, and therefore this is the fifth of his films that I've seen. Some of them have just been awful. In fact, he claims that we are friends because I just didn't review two of his movies. They were so dreadful, I, well, it's when you go to a debut concert, you'll find music <coughs> critics when they cover, you know, cover about 15 debuts over the weekend, and they may report on three. Because you know, why squash a, a very innocent fly that uh, won't ever grow up to be uh, a big fly? Uh, and uh, his work is terribly uneven. Now, Putney Swope is the first of his films to come into a theatrical house. And it's certainly the best of his film, of, uh, of what he's done. I think that parts of it are so absolutely brilliant, and parts of it are so absolutely awful. They are in the most execrable taste. They are boring. They're childish. They're awful. But the parts that are good, to me, are so very brilliant that I have to credit him and encourage him, and I just can't wait for his next film with growth. Because he did something that no one else has quite had the guts to do, and particularly if you are white, it is a dangerous thing to do. He took as his thesis, he has an advertising agency, his roots are in advertising, and he loves to satirize, nothing more than that, and in fact he has a takeoff, he has several commercials, uh, Erzatz commercials, that have made me totally incapacitated when it comes to looking at commercials, uh, on the girl commercial and the cereal commercial. But at any rate, uh, in an advertising agency, they have a token Negro. Uh, the chairman of the board drops dead, and they have to elect a new chairman of the board. And they can't vote for themselves. That's against the rules and regulations. And so, since each of them thinks, gee, poor Putney, he ought to get a vote at least. They all wind up voting for Putney, and he becomes the head of the advertising agency. He is the token Negro. And uh, Putney takes over the agency, and it becomes the Truth and Soul Agency, TS, as we say. And the essential theme, which is a very unfashionable and not nice one to take up, is that black or white, if you get involved in a horrendous business, it is going to affect you. Uh, if you lie down with dogs, you will get the fleas. Uh, and just because you are black, you are not going to turn out to be any more noble or any purer or any different uh, from the white man who was in the same situation. Now, this he does some of the time brilliantly and some of the time badly. But that was how I felt. And at least you stayed and slept. A lot of people I know walked out in absolute wrath. I had the feeling that it could have been marvelous, and I kept waiting, you know, for it. Well, you know, when it doesn't quite work and you haven't got the money to redo it and you leave it in. that it was a series of pieces. One felt that it had been put together. He's one of the few funny men around. And, you know, actually, except for, say, the Woody Allen movie, uh, which was kind of Marx Brotherish and great fun, uh, there just aren't very many funny people making movies anymore. In as much as we do live in New York, how much censorship is being demanded by the rest of the country? 
horrendous amount. How effective do you think this will be? Well, they were responsible, certainly, for this code that we now have. I don't know about you, but I, I have found the code affects me uh, uh, because of my child, you know. They let him in to see the most awful things that I would never let a kid in to see. And they keep him out of marvel. He had to fight his way into if. Well, he kept lying about his age, but, uh, but which is made for, for bright kids between the ages of, from 12 up. It's a boy's movie. It's a superb movie. They wouldn't let these kids in. Well, what, uh, so it does affect us, basically. Also, we misjudge movies. They give the same X to a Putney Swope, which is outrageous, as they give to Without a Stitch, which is pure pornography. Uh, and therefore, many good movies are smeared, because a lot of us say, oh, well, it's an X. I don't want to go. And you take a film like Last Summer, which I thought was one of the was undoubtedly the finest youth film involved with the problems of youth. That movie was rated X. It had a very violent rape scene at the end that I would not have chosen to have my child at the age of 13 see. If I had a child of 15 or 16, uh, this, this was an excellent film for him to see. Well, you ought to see the letters that I have gotten from all parts of the country because I had very high praise for this film. And wherever it went, and went out with a quote, remarkable, Judith Christ, NBC. And I would get letters from every part of the country. I think I, we've gotten, my secretary was tabulating, and I've gotten up into the hundreds, saying, oh, yes, a remarkable movie, remarkably filthy. Or perhaps children in your jet set behave this way. But out here in Ohio, our youngsters are not like that. Well, my stock answer included, among other things, that it would be as if you had done, uh, let's say, uh, Macbeth, and you got a letter from someone saying, well, I don't know how the ladies in the League of Women Voters behave in New York, but out here in Ohio, we don't have women murdering their husbands, uh, competitors, and so on. Uh, it was just astounding the way people thought this was filth, because these kids uh, smoked, and they drank beer, and they looked at each other's uh, breasts, and uh, so on. Uh, and we really forget, this is why I find myself obliged, let alone pleasure, to uh, tour the country a lot. Now, it's very different on college campuses. And again, we start thinking we're all talking, well, we are talking the same movie language. Uh, the same movies are successful. Uh, in different parts of the country. But real grassrootsy people are in a frenzy uh, about the filth. And why? Because they live in communities that have two movie houses. And there were many people, say, even in the New York area, over a weekend, if you wanted to, let's get out of the house and go to the movies, right? And if you weren't seeing Fanny Hill at the, on the Lowe's Showcase Circus, you had to go see Curious Yellow on the United Artists Showcase circuit. Now, if you have either with blinders on or some reason gone in and seen either of those movies, you are going to come out and say, well, now, really, what are we getting to? Uh, where I can go to the movies and see absolutely nothing uh, but uh, cheap cheap pornography. I mean, not, not even good pornography. It isn't even pornographic. So the people are incensed. They are unable to do anything about it. And so you get weird censorship. Uh, you get local newspapers that won't take ads for X movies. Uh, this is ridiculous, really ridiculous. Uh, that is a restraint of trade. Uh, this is, and, and it is being fought. Uh, you get police chiefs locally. One of them borrowed a print of a movie recently in Connecticut. And when it came back, several scenes were missing. Uh, the uh, policeman had just decided to chop it off. Uh, there was, and my favorite lady is the one in Connecticut who went to see the uh, killing of Sister George, where very briefly the scene between the two women had been eliminated. And when she got out, she was furious. And she said, when I pay for a dirty movie, I want to see it. <laughs> and asked for her money back because the scene had been deleted. 
And uh, this is essentially where it's at. So that there has to be a very great alertness. The only reason the movie industry put in this rating thing was because they felt that the cops were hot on their heels. And it is unfair because the person who is prosecuted locally by the local censor is the poor little guy who's selling the tickets uh, or who is managing the theater for somebody who's living in Chicago and saying, boy, $400 million came in this week from uh, this and that. Uh, I myself feel that the people who do have to be responsible uh, for it are basically the exhibitors. On the other hand, you, have you, you know the Forum Theater on Broadway, it's one of those small things on the west side of the street, uh, was running a movie that I had missed at screenings and I went to see it and it was based on the Mailer book, The American Dream, An American Dream. Anyway, it was just a, a stupid, disgusting movie. And it, when I came out, the manager had recognized me and I was looking at the photographs that were on display. Uh, this was about a year and a half ago before they began putting on those little television screens on Broadway to show you the choicer scenes, most of which don't even appear in the movie. Uh, and uh, we were talking and I said, boy, I mean, this really is just a grind movie and the display of pictures out here is unappetizing. And he said, uh, don't I know it, but this is a block booking. I had to take this movie along with two others. But he said, you know, I try to tell people what they're after. Now, he's only the manager. He doesn't really care about how much business he does. He said, I try to tell people, you know, I kind of watch them. I spend as much time as I can out here seeing who's coming in. He said, a woman came up the other evening with two little girls. Said they were about eight and 10. And I went over to her and I said, you know, lady, I don't think your two little girls are going to enjoy this movie. I don't think it's for them. And she said, I took them to Virginia Woolf and they loved it. <laughs> so he said, all right. You know. Yeah. Well, Why yes. so important about Bonnie and Clyde? Is it a type? It always seems to be mentioned in reviews as some type of something. Well, it had. It was a, a very stylish film uh, in the first place. I think it uh, was quite different from the traditional film in its style. Uh, in the, to me, the accomplishment of the film was that it took an American myth, part of our mythology, as Bonnie and Clyde are, and it dealt with them in terms that are very contemporary, that I found most young people, and certainly that I could, relate to because they were concerned with the young person in revolt, the person who wants to rebel. And this is very generic to each generation. Uh, and in Bonnie's case and Clyde's case, within this context, because uh, it is, I want to be somebody. Again, a very universal point. Well, how are you going to be somebody? And early on, somebody says to him, what do you do? And he looks around, and there in the 1930s set up, there is a sign of a foreclosure by a bank. And on the spur of the moment, he says, I rob banks. And they thereby go out of the establishment. And Arthur Penn has done a number of movies that deal with the outsider. Uh, in The Left-Handed Gun, he took Billy the Kid. Uh, in Mickey One, uh, it's modern man in the guise of a nightclub entertainer who bucks the syndicate. They put themselves outside society by an instant decision. We rob banks. Uh, the way kids say today, I'm against the establishment. Uh, I'm a new radical. Uh, I'm whatever. Or in my day, I'm for peace. Uh, and uh, once outside, they cannot return. There are several, to me, very interesting themes in this. Uh, they are not enjoying being outside the law. People who have not seen Bonnie and Clyde are very prone to say, oh, it glorifies a pair of criminals. Uh, it doesn't. It shows what a really terrible life they lead. 
They are perpetually on the run. They're living in the sleaziest of motels and hotels. They are lousy at their job. They're very bad bank robbers. They're not getting rich. They don't even have a good sex life. They get no satisfactions. And then comes the very terrible moment at the family picnic. They are still trying to retain a tie. They are trying to return. And Bonnie or Clyde says, you know, after we're through with this, we're going to come stay with you to Bonnie's mother. And she says, oh, no, you don't. You'll be dead if you come stay with me. And there is the total rejection, no return, a last-minute hope of, well, maybe we can make it together. But they don't really. And it's a very sad story. But it is all told in a very ricky-ticky way with the banjos and the car chases and the comic relief, because Arthur Penn is very good, I think. And it's very much like the, the gatekeeper uh, in Macbeth or the grave diggers in Hamlet. You have your little episodes and you have this ricky-ticky music all plunking away, and then comes really the smashing climax. And to me, to say things of this importance but in terms that will appeal to the mass audience. Because I think movies are a mass medium. Yes, I have pet movies that I know only about 22 of us will ever like. Uh, but uh, basically, I want every, on a good level, every good work of art is going to hit a number of intellectual levels. Uh, and uh, I think that Bonnie and Clyde did and was therefore important. And wasn't uh, the first, what did you say? Well, I felt, and a great many of my colleagues didn't, uh, certainly I know the mass of students <coughs> with whom I have contact felt that it was certainly the best film of 1968. Uh, it, I found it an overpowering film. And it had that impact as well as the quality. I think Easy Rider had impact, certainly. Uh, but I would debate its quality. Well, I'm afraid we've come. Uh, we, we have to call it to a halt. You've had impact, Miss Christ. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.